Hello, hello, we cannot hear you. Can you check if they can hear us? <clears throat> can, can you hear us, guys, on Zoom? If you can, just somebody say something. Okay. Yes, we can. Yes. Yeah. The problem now is now that you can't see the screen. <laughs> so. OK. Thank you. That wasn't much time taken up. Anyway, so uh, we're going to uh, today's lecture is going to be on the problem of learning. We're going to brief, briefly go over the perceptron rule for uh, learning individual perceptrons, and uh, we will also look to address the pro larger problem of training entire networks. I've listed Adeline and Madeline on the uh, slide. We won't go over that topic in the lecture itself, but it's in the slides. I expect you to sort of read up about it and answer questions in the quiz. And we're going to look at uh, empirical risk minimization. That last bullet point is something that we won't get into in today's class. That will be in the next class. So here's a quick recap. We saw that universe, neural networks are universal function approximators. Shikhar, what did I mean by that statement? <laughs> 
So we can model. So does somebody want to expand on that? What do I mean by we can model? Yes. You can create an arbitrarily precise approximation. Right. If you give me a function, I can build, construct a network that can approximate it to arbitrary precision. And for that, of course, the network must satisfy the minimal architecture constraints. Now, uh, in all of the problems that we saw, like, oh my, please, what happened now? Oh, okay. So, uh, like voice recognition or image captioning or playing games, in each case, you had something going into this box, the neural network, and something coming out. And because it takes an input and produces an output, this is a function, so long as the output is deterministic. And because it's a function, we know any function can be modeled by a neural network, so we can model it using a neural network. But then to, to, dis, to determine how exactly to do this, there are many questions to answer. There's a game state going in and a game prediction or a uh, game recommendation coming out. Functions, as we know it, are mathematical objects, right? So that means these things going in and things going out have to be converted to some kind of mathematical representation. The question is, how do you represent what goes in and how do we represent what comes out? And then, of course, there's the box itself, which is the network. How do we compose the network that performs the requisite function? So we're not going to be looking at representing the inputs and outputs today. We're going to be focusing a bit on composing a network that performs the function that we would like to model. Now, again, the way we saw it, the network itself, the neural network is a network of basic units, which we call perceptrons. In the general setting, the inputs we said would be real valued. So we have, each perceptron has a collection of inputs coming in, and it has a bias term as well. So the perceptron eventually computes. Can you see the mouse? Yeah. The perceptron eventually computes an affine function of the inputs. I will be representing this affine value with the symbol z through the, like, through the course, and then finally computes an function of this affine value, the most basic perceptron that we saw uh, computed a threshold function on the affine value, what we call an activation. But we could have other kinds of activations like uh, the sigmoid, the smooth version of it, or the other figures that we have at the bottom right. So we saw this. Now, what are the parameters of this perceptron? Anyone? What decide? Uh, decides how the perceptron behaves. Yes, Karan, you're right, W and B, the weights and the bias, correct? So uh, again, when I draw it, I can explicitly have a bias going out, or there's a different way of representing it. I can just extend my input with an additional value, which is pegged to one. And the weight associated with this one ends up being the bias. So there are different ways of representing the same unit, I can extend the input to have an extra uh, input value that's one. And then if I do so, then I don't have to explicitly be, be talking about biases. And so I want you to remember that anytime I talk about perceptrons, I have illustrations of this kind. Sometimes I will show the bias, sometimes I will not. When I don't show the bias, you must internally recognize that I'm assuming that there's an extra input that accounts for the bias, something that's pegged to one. Now, we're going to assume that the network is strictly feed forward. What I mean by this is that the computation is directed. It goes from the input to the output. So anytime you provide an input, that input is going to proceed through the network and no perceptron or some, I will also call perceptrons neurons, no neuron in the network is actually going to revisit a, visit an input once it has been processed. So there are no loops. Now we will discuss loopy networks, but that's later in the course. Now part of the design of the network is the architecture of the network itself. How many, neuro how many layers does it have? How many neurons does it have in each layer, et cetera? But for now, we're going to assume that it's given and the network has the capacity to model the function that we are trying to model. Now, Will, what do I mean by this statement? The network has the capacity to model the func function that I want to model. Like, what's the 
Can I repeat the question? So when I say the network has the capacity to model the function that I'm, that I'm trying to model, what would that statement mean? The layers should be wide enough. The layers are wide enough and deep enough so that there is some setting of the parameters which will give me that function. I may not know the setting, but it exists, right? That's what we mean. Now, when I think of the network this way, the network itself is this complicated structure where many perceptrons connect to many other perceptrons. Every perceptron has its own set of weights and biases. So if I represent the collection of weights and biases for all the perceptrons, all the neurons in the network by the symbol W, the network is a function. It takes an input and eventually produces an output, right? And so uh, this notation up there, f of x semicolon w, indicates that it's a function of the input x, and whatever follows the semicolon are the parameters. The output can be changed. The behavior of the function can, can be changed by changing the parameters. The output of the function can be changed by changing the input. And so when I'm speaking of learning a network, what I'm saying, what I'm really speaking of is trying to figure out what these parameter setting values must be in order for the function to come perform, to model or emulate a specific function that I would like to model and like it to emulate. So, any questions? So again, Thomas, what do I mean by saying learning a network? Just to. Determining the parameters such that the function computes whatever I wanted to compute, right? Now we know that the MLP can technically represent any function, but then for it to represent any function, we need to choose the appropriate set of weights and biases. Now let's say I have a network which has the capacity to model the function to the right. How do I choose the weights and biases? Now, one simple way of designing the network is to just do it by hand. Let's say I want to construct a network that uh, uh, has this decision boundary. One inside the yellow region, zero outside. I can handcraft it. I can have, you know, I know exactly what the structure for this network must be. I can work out the equations. Then, you know, I can actually sort of write out the uh, perceptrons, what the weights and the biases must be for each of the perceptrons in my network. Connect them all up and voila, I have a network that actually computes the function that I would like it to. Is this feasible for every possible function? Clearly not, right? Because this only works for the simplest functions. Handcrafting networks is not going to be possible for all but the simplest functions. So this is not something you want to be doing. <coughs> what you want to be doing is to learn these things automatically. So let's say I have some function g of x that I'm trying to emulate, that I would like the model to compute, the, the, the network to compute. So we want to be able to derive the parameters w such that the network function f of x, w, x semicolon w ends up being the same as g of x. So g of x is the function that you want the network to compute. f of x semicolon w is the network function itself. You want to tweak the w's so that the function f ends up being the same as the function g. So how can I do it? Now, for any given setting of the weights w, just for illustration, consider a function of a single variable, right? So I can have, this is my variable x, and I have f of x semicolon w, that's my network function, and that's going to be some, something of this kind. We don't know what it is. If I change w, this thing is going to change. And then I have my function g, which is, do I have a different color? Possibly. I see a green, okay, let's use this. So I have my function g. This is the function that I want the network to model. So what do I need to do? I need to sort of tweak the parameters w such that the gap between these two is minimized. In other words, I want 
this area to become zero. When it does, I have learned a network that actually wants the function. How can, how would we do it? If I want to formulate it properly, I need the first, what is the first thing I would need to do in order to be able to minimize this area? To design the W2, choose the W to minimize this area. I need some way of computing that area, right? So, and to compute the area, what is the first thing I require? First, I need to know what it is I'm quantifying. So I've just casually drawn this and I've sort of fooled you into believing that there's a gap, but I need some way of quantifying this difference, right? So the very first thing I will require is to specify an error of some kind, which tells me what the difference between the two is. In these you know, trivial illustrations, it's easy enough, but networks will compute multidimensional outputs. So you can't just be drawing things of this kind, right? And then once I define the area, I add this error, I want to take the integral of the error over the entire input space. And now I want to compute my weights such that, such that this integrated error is minimized. Make sense, right? So that's what we will be doing we will be trying to compute this W <coughs> such that the total error, which is the integral of this, of the error over the entire input, which is the shaded area, is minimized. But in order to do this, there's one more assumption. I'm assuming that I am able to compute the error, but I'm also assuming that I know the function G of X, right? In, in practice, you're not gonna be given G of X. Because if I know G of X, why do I need a network in the first place, right? Uh, if I know, if I have some function which can take in a game state and give me the next game state, I, sh I wouldn't be burning up parts of the Amazon trying to train a neural network to do this, part, do this job. So uh, we don't have G of X. What we, so what we will do is we will sample this function G of X. What I mean by sampling this function G of X is to say, I have this function G shown by the blue curve at different inputs, I'm going to try to obtain the value of G. So I will get for various inputs shown in the red over there, I'm going, to, I'm going to try to get the value of G. This doesn't mean I know the value G of the function G itself. I know the value of the function at some specific locations. And it's very easy to collect, collect these things, right? If I'm doing voice recognition, for instance, I give you a voice recording and I know what it's, the output must be. If I'm trying to classify an image, I take an image, I know what the classification output must be. So collecting these samples from the function is easy. And so that's what we're gonna be doing, right? And then uh, this, uh, you guys, can you shut your laptops, if you don't mind? That's, can you shut the laptop? Yeah, thank you. Part of the rules of this class, okay. And so just from this collection of data points, we are going to try to, learn the entire function. We must learn the entire function from these few samples. These are, these are what we will call the training samples. And the hope, so what we will do is over here, instead of having the, knowing the function everywhere, we are going to know the function at some locations. So you know this guy, you know this guy, right? Maybe you know this guy, and then maybe you know this guy. And so these are the four training points that you have in this example, and you're going to try to estimate the W to compute this value at this input for each of the inputs that we've got. And then we are on prayer. We're sort of hoping that it's going to give you the right answer everywhere else as well. So what we will, so since this is all we have, what we will do is to compute the empirical error that's empirical because it's based on a bunch of samples that you empirically collected. And the error is going to be the sum of the errors at these specific locations. And you're going to try to minimize, uh, estimate the W to minimize the sum of the errors at all of these locations. In order to do this, so here's, so here's how we actually recast the problem of training the network. 
you're going to find the network parameters that try to compute the desired output at each of these training inputs as accurately as possible. We're going to try to fit the training points exactly. And the assumption or the hope is that if you do so well, then the function will be correct everywhere else as well. Professor, um, yeah. sorry to interrupt. Um, do you mind expanding on the usage of work empirical in this case and in this context? Empirical in the sense that these are observed. So if I'm giving you a function g of x, you haven't actually read the value of g of x at every x, right? Empirical in, the, in, this, in this context is that you have empirically determined that at this specific x, this is the value that I must get. So collecting those samples, those are empirically observed samples. Thank you. Yeah, right? And so here's the story so far. Learning a neural network is the same as determining the parameters of the network required for it to model a desired function. It must have sufficient capacity to model the function. Ideally, we would like to optimize the network to represent the desired function everywhere. However, this requires knowledge of the function everywhere and we, can't, we don't have this. So instead, we're going to draw input-output sample pairs, which, are, which, which we will call training instances. And we're going to learn the network parameters to fit these training instances. And then we hope and pray, right? So there's a lot of hope and prayer in machine learning. Here's your first poll. And let me answer. Again, I'm doing the mean thing. I call it one poll, but there are two questions. And each question has multiple very complicated options. Can whoever is speaking on Zoom please mute yourself? Yeah. Okay, 15 seconds, guys. All right, who wants to answer the first question? Adish, what's the first question? But you can see it on the screen, okay, tell me. Mm -hmm. True. Does somebody on Zoom want to answer the second question? Anyone? One, two, and three, A, B, and C, yeah, okay. So let's check if you're right. Neural networks are universal approximators. Any network of any architecture can approximate any function to arbitrary precision. Is it true? No, because it, you need to have the appropriate capacity, correct, right? So that's false. And uh, the net, if the network has sufficient capacity, the, uh, then we, should be, we can model the net function. Uh, it's a parametric function, and its parameters are its weights and biases. And these must be learned to best approximate the target function, right? So let's begin with a simple task. I'm going to try to learn a classifier in this manner. This was actually amongst the earliest problems addressed using multi-layer perceptrons. And specifically, I'm going to consider binary classification. Yes, Peter? Uh, because I'm saying that any network of any architecture, that's not true, right? You need to have specific, uh, sufficient capacity, right? So these are things you have to keep in mind when you build these things. So I'm going to consider binary classification to start off. Now, in binary classification, you're given some input. The output is either a 0 or a 1, or you can call it minus 1 on 1, depending on how you look at it, right? So let's say you have just a scalar input. You're going to be given a collection of in inputs, x's, and their corresponding outputs y, which, is, which are 0 for some and one for the other. So the ideal function over here is going to be maybe the dotted blue line, and uh, that's the classification function you want to learn. And the network itself, with its current setting of parameters, is going to be maybe the red function. So the network is making errors at some points, right? 
The current network has got it right out here at x1, has got it right at x2, it's got it right at x5, but it's making an error at x3 and x4. So we can count the total error, and then we can try to minimize, tweak the network parameters to minimize this error. Now, this is, so learning the classifier over here is trying to find the Ws that minimize the count of misclassifications. Now, when you begin talking about multi-layer perceptrons, it's just networks of perceptrons of this kind. This was the original MLP as proposed by Rosenblatt and Minsky. This is what, where each unit has this structure, right? It's computing an affine function of the inputs and then putting it through a threshold, active, through an activation. Initially, we will assume that the activation is a threshold activation because this was what was the original neural network. And let's work with this. How do we train it using just training instances of input output pairs. Now for a simple single perceptron, we know this is what the function looks like. It takes a, a, a real input and it computes a heavy side function. There's some hyperplane. On one side of the hyperplane, the psi output is zero. On the other side, the output is a one. And what you are going to be given are just samples, like these red and blue dots. It says on the red dots, the output must be one. On the blue dots, the output must be zero. And based only on these, you have to learn the heavy side function. That's, this is the simplest uh, model, just a single perceptron, right? Now, if I look at it, you want to find the weights W such that, uh, and the bias B, such that the weighted sum of the inputs and the bias is greater than zero for all the red dots and less than zero for all the blue dots, right? And the boundary is where the weighted sum plus the bias, the affine function is exactly zero. Or instead of trying to think of it in terms of affine functions, which are a bit of a pain to deal with, I can convert it to a linear prop function. What is the difference again between a linear and an affine function, Ansha? So how can I convert an affine function to a linear function? I can just add an extra one and that becomes a weighted sum of inputs, right? So what really is happening? How exactly did I take something that didn't pass through origin and convert it to something that did pass through origin? So this is the odd thing. If I have a line of, of this kind, I can claim that this line is actually one slice of a plane, right? And so I can go up from two dimensions to three, three dimensions in this case. And for the third dimension, let's just say, choose the value one, right? And so I can have a hyperplane which goes through origin, but at one, it gives you that particular line, right? So that's why the you're looking at what happens when the final component is one. When the final component is one, obviously that the, you know, the plane is not going through origin, but the overall plane itself is going through origin. So this is basically what we do when we convert an affine to a linear. We add an extra dimension and we create a hyperplane that goes through the origin and goes through the line. So now this boundary becomes a, becomes a, a hyperplane, right? And we want to find the hyperplane that perfectly separates the two groups of points. Now I have two classes of points. I have classes. Uh -uh. Clearly this is not going back up, okay. Uh, there's a chalk. So now let's say, uh, first, I'm going to, we are looking at summation wi xi equals zero, right? I can take all of the w's and set them into a vector. And so I have my weights as a vector, w1 through w, d, if d is the dimensionality of the space, and I can, the number of inputs, I can write x1 through xd, and so this is the same as saying W transpose X equals zero. That's the boundary, correct? So when I write this, what does it tell me about W and X? Yeah. 
Yeah. They're orthogonal, right? So a play, a, uh, this equation basically says it's the set of all x's that are orthogonal to w, right? And so I have some space. I have chosen w. These are all the x's that are at 90 degrees to w, right? If I just no, draw the arrows. And now for a specific instance, suppose I want, I have a training instance that's positive. Then what do I want W transpose X to be? Positive, negative, or zero? Positive, right? So I want W transpose X to be greater than zero, right? If I just give you an X, a single X, and I ask you to find, tell me what is the best W that ensures that it's as positive as possible. What's that W going to be? <laughs> yeah. Some scalar multiple of X. It's going to be some scalar multiple of X, right? So if I give you some X and I want the plane to be such that W transpose X is positive, then obviously W equals alpha X is your best one because that's simply going to give you W transpose X equals alpha X squared, which is guaranteed to be positive, right? This gives you the largest gap from the boundary. So this, if this is your X, you want that to be the boundary. Now, suppose I give you an X which has a negative label. What do you want W transpose X to be? Negative, right? So in that case, what's the ideal W? The negative, right? So if I have an instance of x, which is uh, negative, so this is still x, but now it's a negative label, then I want w transpose x to be as negative as possible, which means that if this is x, I want this to be w, and that's going to be my boundary. Now observe, that the x's that are on the same side as w are all going to be labeled as x, a positive, and the x's that are on the other side are all going to be labeled as negative, right? So we can just stating that in math, the boundary is the one where w transpose x is zero. You want to find this w, the hyperplane, such that all the positive instances are on one side of the hyperplane, all the negative instances are on the other side, and you want W to be pointing in the direction of the positive instances. So when I'm speaking of learning the perceptron, find the weights vector W such that the plane described by W transpose X perfectly separates the classes and is positive for all the red dots and negative for all the blue dots. So there's a nice closed form solution to this, which is actually on the slides. But then the original algorithm is you know, very intuitive. So let's go through that. It's an online algorithm. What I mean by online is that as the data comes in. You... I just tripped. Okay, yeah. So as the data comes in, uh, you uh, update your estimate, right? So this original uh, perceptron algorithm initializes W somehow and it uses this W to classify the data anytime. Remember how we discussed this when we were talking about Rosenblatt's perceptron. Anytime it makes an error, you adjust W. Now, you can, let's just sort of build up Rosenblatt's algorithm. We're done with this. So suppose this is my current estimate, current estimate for the hyperplane. And then I have an instance X over here, which is supposed to be positive, okay? Is this going to classify this X properly? No. So what do I want to do with my W? Which way do I move the W to make it classify X properly? I'm going to have to drag W towards X, right? Similarly, if I have this one, uh, maybe I have an X over here and this is negative, but this is going to be classifying it as positive, right? Then what do I want to do with W? Yeah. 
I'm going to drag W towards minus X, right? That's a simple concept. That's all we have to do. I mean, logically it makes sense, right? That's all you really want to do. And so that is the perceptron learning algorithm. You start off with some W, then you begin classifying your instances. If a positive instance is misclassified, W is dragged towards X. And the way you drag it towards X is simply by adding X. If a negative instance is misclassified, then you're going to be dragging W exactly against X, which is to say you're adding the negative of X. So here's what you would do. I'm going to use plus one and minus one as my labels rather than one and zero. And so here's what you would do. You would say Y for each training instance is either plus one or minus one. And you cycle, you initialize W, you cycle through the training instances. For each training instance, you check the sign of W transpose X. If the sign of W transpose X is positive, you're labeling it as positive, right? And if the instance is positive, Y is also positive. So the sign of W transpose X will be equal to Y. If the sign of W transpose X is negative and the instance is negative, again, the sign of Y and the sign of W transpose X are going to be the same. In every other case, the two are going to be different, right? So uh, you would sort of check the sign of W transpose X against Y. If the two are not the same, then you're going to be adding Y times X. Yes. So you want Y is going to be either plus one or minus one, correct? For a positive instance, if X is a positive instance, then you want W transpose X to be greater than zero. Sign of W transpose X is the same as Y. Uh, Correct? Professor, yeah. Do you mind, um, I suppose, uh, visualizing how the addition uh, affects the um, hyperplane in this case? We will be seeing, seeing some pictures, right? Okay. So okay. similarly, if X belongs to minus one, you want W transpose X ideally to be less than zero. So the sign of this should be the same as the Y itself. Correct? In other words, ideally, you want Y times W transpose X to, to be positive. So you want Y times W transpose X should be greater than zero for correct classification. Otherwise, it is misclassified, right? Now, here's how I can rewrite it. If X is a negative instance, then I want to be pushing W away from X. So I want to be doing W equals W minus X. If X is a positive instance and it's misclassified, I want to be push, pulling W towards X. So it's gonna be W equals W plus X, right? I can just compactly write that as W equals W plus Y times X. Because Y tells you which direction it's going to be going in. Everybody with me here? Right. Easy, so how does that work? For whoever asked the uh, visualization. So let's say I have all of these training instances. I just give you an initial W, it gives me this hyperplane. If I check through all of the training instances, I find that this guy is misclassified. That's a misclassified negative instance. So what I will do is subtract that X, which is to add the negative of X to my weight that gives me my new weight, that's going to give me my new decision boundary, right? So uh, this is the perceptron, SVMs and perceptrons are both linear classifiers. The SVM basically tries to, the learning objective is to maximize margins. We're just looking at the simple perceptron classification rule. So everybody with me so far, right? And I don't know who asked that question, was it Isaac? Uh, the uh, relationship between SVMs and percept the perceptron rule is in the slides. Take a look. Now, so I have a new weight and a new boundary. But this guy is misclassifying this instance, which is a positive instance. So I'm going to be adding that positive instance to my weight. I have a new weight. I have a new boundary. Now everything is correctly classified. I'm done. So what... If the what, what we have here is that if the classes are linearly separable, which means that if it is possible for me to draw a hyperplane which separates the positives from the negatives, then I'm guaranteed to that in a finite number of steps, this update rule will find 
a boundary which separates the positives from the negatives. On the other hand, if, the, uh, if you have something of this kind where there isn't any hyperplane that exactly separates the reds from the blues, then my perceptron learning rule is just going to keep wandering round and round and round because there is no answer to find. It will never converge. So, uh, <coughs> if yes. There's a very uh, nice little proof which is on a, which is on a, one of the readings on the course page. And the, and the actual number of steps is also, the bound on the number of steps is also on the slides. Take a look. I'm just, just, not, I'm just not going through this in class. But yes, it's guaranteed, right? And even better, there's a closed form solution. I can give it to you in one computation, the answer. But the point is that if the classes are not linearly separable, there is no boundary to find. This algorithm is never going to converge, right? But now let's take a more complicated problem, like this guy the double pentagon example that we've seen before. I want to learn an MLP that gives me an output inside the yellow regions and a zero of one inside the yellow regions and zero outside. Except you're not given the boundaries, you're just, you're just given the dots. And you want to uh, learn the network parameters and you're given the perfect architecture for the network as shown by the left, right? We know that network is capable of learning this decision boundary. It has just the right architecture. There is a setting of weights which will actually learn this, these boundaries. We know this. We've seen this in class. So given this, we've seen how the perceptron algorithm can learn the perfect boundary for a uh, linearly separable class when, you know, with, with a sufficient number of steps. So this is a multi-layer perceptron and we know that the MLP can actually learn a boundary for this guy. So will the perceptron rule actually, can we actually use the perceptron rule to find the parameters over here as well? Does anyone want to take a guess? Yes. But we know, so the point is this, we know that we have perceptrons which can love this boundary, right? So in principle, it must be possible, but not using the perceptron rule. And we'll see why, you're right. But the answer is not, in fact, you're fully right. So the lower, lower level perceptrons are all linear classifiers, right? They can only learn boundaries of this kind. In order to learn a boundary of this kind, what kind of, how must the data be labeled? the data must be linearly separable for each of these lower layer perceptrons as well, right? And as Sophie mentioned, these labels are not linearly separable, right? So, you know, just consider, let's just assume, let's, let's not complicate life too much. Let's assume that of the 11 perceptrons that I have, or was it 13, I have learned 12 perfectly already all I'm trying to do is to learn this one thirteenth perceptron. If I get this right, my network is going to work properly, right? But it's going to see this data. So let's say that, you know, there are 13 perceptrons in this network. Let's say that I have, you know, given you the correct parameter values for the remaining 12. So all that you have to learn is this one highlighted perceptron and you're going to have to learn it from this data, right? Can you learn it from this data? Anyone? No, right? Because it's not linearly separable, right? So what do we need to do to learn this boundary? You're going to have to relabel some of the training instances to learn this one. You want to make this data linearly separable and that causes compl complications, but before that there's a problem. 
Okay, 10 seconds, guys. Okay, stopping it here. Uh, Eric, do you want to answer that first question? So you can't learn this using the perceptron, simple perceptron learning rule, right? And what are the problems we see for the second question? Both of them are right, yeah? So here we are again. If I have this problem, and if I want to consider a single learn linear classifier that must be learned from the training data, we know it cannot be learned from this data. The individual classifier actually requires data of this kind, where the classes are linearly separable, but this is not given, right? So if this is not given, and this is the data that I have given you, how are you, we know that, this, that there's a perceptron which will give you the correct boundary. So what can you do next? How would you solve this problem? Relabel the data, right? Which, but how? Mm. No, because if this is something like XR, they are, they're not informing you anything about this perceptron. So anybody else? Josh, you want to take a guess? So how, okay, how would you relabel the data here? Anyone? Anyone on Zoom? How would you relabel, relabel the data here? Yes. Could you use like another perceptron? Yeah, uh, you just punted the, on the problem, right? So the answer is you don't know. You're going to have to try every possible way of relabeling the data. You're going to, you know, if there are n training instances, there are two ways to n possible ways of relabeling the data, right? And so you're going to relabel the data every possible way, learn the perceptron, and then check if the final network is correct on all your training instances. And then one of these relabelings will actually allow you to learn a perceptron which does the right job on the entire training set. Does that make sense? Right? So this is when I'm just trying to learn one perceptron from the entire network. What if I, uh, you know, this is, I'm going to have to try every way of relabeling the data, and then one of them will allow me to, permit me to learn a boundary which actually learns a double, double pentagon. The reality is that, you know, all of these perceptrons must be learned, right? So this, relabeling and attempting to figure out what is correct has to be done for every one of these lines. So here's what we would be doing. For every one of these perceptrons, you're going to try every possible way of relabeling the inputs and learning the boundary, and then you're going to be checking on all of your training instances if the final output of the network is correct. This is an exponential search over inputs, right? It's exponential in the number of neurons and it's exponential in the number of inputs. This is clearly not going to be anything reasonable that you can to, to do. So, you know, we must know the desired output of every neuron for every training instances. The output should be such that each, the neurons indiv each neuron individually has a linearly separable task, but together they give you a, the correct answer on the entire training input. And getting this wrong for even one perceptron is going to give you garbage, right? This is not a feasible task. So the uh, training this network using the perceptron rule is a combinatorial optimization problem. We don't know the outputs of the individual intermediate neurons. So we must also determine the correct output for each neuron for every training instance, and this is exponential in the inputs. This is not, a, not something that you want to be doing. Then, so the perceptron learning rules cannot be directly used for MLPs, exponential complexity. Can we use a greedy algorithm instead to somehow solve this problem? People have proposed it. Bernie Vidro, uh, who is a legend, proposed uh, Adeline and Madeline. I have my own gripe against him. He stole two of my best students, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> he's, a, he's old, he's in, in his 90s, but they went to him anyway. Uh, and it's on the slides. We're gonna skip this in class, but here's the story. But do take a look at the slides. Like I said, it's gonna turn up in your quiz. So the story so far is that learning a network 
uh, is the same as learning the weights and biases to compute a target function. It's going to require a network with sufficient capacity. In practice, we learn networks by fitting them to match the input-output relation of the training instances you've provided. A linear decision, decision boundary can be learned by a single perceptron in actually linear time if the classes are linearly separable, but nonlinear decision boundaries require networks of perceptrons. Training an MLP with the threshold function activation perceptrons will require knowledge of the input-output relationship for every training instance, for every perceptron in the network, and this must be determined as part of the training, which makes it basically an NP problem. And the realization that this is what is required to train these networks basically kind of stalled uh, research and advances in neural networks for almost a decade. In fact, well over a decade till, uh, uh, I forget his name, this guy in MIT came up with back propagation. So here's the problem, right? Uh, the error in metric that we are looking at is, is the network correct on each of our training instances? And it's just counting the errors. And you're trying to learn the parameters to minimize this error. But now let's say the dotted line is the correct classifier, and the red line is your current network. If I move the, the, the current network is basically just a threshold, right? If, the, if I move the threshold to the left by some small value, is the total error going to change? If I move that red curve left by a small value, will the error change? It will not, right? It hasn't crossed any training point. If I move it right by a small value, is the error going to change? Also no, right? So if I wiggle the parameters a little bit and make the network, the function change, is this inform me, informing me about whether the wiggle that I have introduced is going in the correct direction or not, right? So the issue over here is that the perceptron is a flat function with derivative, basically a small perturbation of the input doesn't change the classification error. And so if I shift the function right, I have no indication that I should continue doing this to improve the function. Or more generally, if you think of the perceptron, because it's a threshold activation, the slope is zero everywhere except at the boundary, right? So uh, even in the case of a, so basically when I change the, if I have this training instance of the, these training instances, and if the blue for a curve is my current perceptron, when I change the weights, I'm basically changing the angle. I could change the angles all the way from here to here or even more without changing the error. And so I don't know in this case whether I should be rotating it left or rotating it right because a small rotation doesn't give me any indication of what's going on, right? Whether it's getting better or whether it's getting worse. And if you've got something uh, you know, more complex, even this trivial problem, this just compounds the problem. Every individual perceptron over here has zero derivative almost everywhere. You could wiggle every one of them and you would, you would have no idea of whether you're going in the correct direction. So we need to sort of uh, change the, uh, you know, change our way of computing the mismatch such that modifying the classifier slightly lets us know if we're going in the correct direction or not. This sort of, requires changing two things. It requires us to change our activation functions from, th from the threshold activations. And it also requires us to change the manner in which we're computing error. You can't just be computing classification error, you have to do one better. So uh, our mismatch function will not, now not just count error, count errors, but it's going to count a proxy for it. Something that looks like error, but it's not actually error. So we're changing the specification itself. What we'll do is we're going to try to make this activation function, the sigma over there, differentiable with non-zero derivatives, non-zero uh, you know, finite derivatives over most of the space. So this guy is going to be changed, which means you're not going to be changing, they're using the activation function on top. You're going to be using one of the things below. Now, so, if I change this activation function, 
from the threshold to let's say the sigmoid, which is the one in the middle. How does this, that help us? If, let's consider a simple one dimensional example with just a single perceptron, right? In a one dimensional problem, your, your linear classifier is a threshold. You're gonna choose a threshold and you say everything on one side is one, the other, everything on the other side is zero. So let's say I've got the dotted uh, line on top with my threshold activation and the threshold is at T1. If I change my threshold from T1 to T2, the number of errors has not changed. So although I'm moving it in the correct direction, that information is not evident from the change in the errors from the output when I actually change the threshold. So instead of using a threshold activation, I'm going to use a sigmoid like the figure at the bottom. And instead of just counting errors, the sigmoid is giving me a value between zero and one, right? And the target value is either zero or one. I can compute the difference. How wrong is the sigmoid? And I can sum this up. And now if you look at this guy over here, the, uh, so this sigmoid can be changed to a classification rule by saying that if the output of the sigmoid is greater than 0.5, I'm going to call it a one, class one. If it's less than 0.5, that the uh, class is zero. So even from this output, I can actually perform classification, right? But then I can actually begin measuring the lengths of these lines and take the total length of all of these lines. And when I do so, when I move this threshold, which is where the sigmoid crosses from below 0.5 to above 0.5, when I move the threshold left from here, to here, the actual errors, the classification errors have not changed. But, but what about the total length of the lines? Has that changed, right? And so if I just look at the length of the lines, which, I, which is not classification error, right? It's some proxy for it. That tells me that I'm going in the correct direction. And I can use that information to actually adjust my parameters. I move it as, aha, this is getting better. Let me continue moving in this direction. So. Uh, that's why we're gonna change the activation and we're gonna change the manner in which we compute errors. So here's a point. Mm -hmm. Okay, 10 seconds, guys. Among other things, this becomes a fast reading class. Okay, I'll stop. I actually gave you 15 after I said 10, and very nice. Okay, uh, now, uh, does anybody want to answer the first question? Nora, what's, yes, Sophie, go ahead. The first two are right. And what about the second question? Anybody want to answer me from the back? Akshara, what is the answer to the second question? Pardon me? Yeah, the second, okay. The first two are right for the first one. All of them are right for the second question, right? Shifting the function left or right would not change the overall classification error unless the crossover point where the function crosses 0.5 moves past a misclassified sample. On the other hand, shifting the function changes the total distance of the value of the function from its target value, right? And so the derivative, which means that the derivative, what does the derivative actually compute? A derivative tells you how much a small perturbation of a value changes the value of the function itself. So if I'm looking at the total distance, then the derivative of this total distance with respect to the shift is non-zero in every case, correct? So in this case, it's telling me that 
uh, reducing the threshold a little bit is reducing the total distance. The derivative is in the, you know, positive, right? So, uh, yeah. So going back to how we're gonna learn the network, we're going to define a divergence function with the, between, and we're going to first define this error. We so just sort of introduced the concept of an error earlier, right? We're going to change the concept of an error to something a little more abstract, a divergence function. And the divergence function has to have these properties. If my target function is exactly the same as the, if the function I'm computing is exactly the same as the target function, the divergence at that point must be zero. If the two are not identical, the divergence must be positive. It doesn't matter whether the, the target function is below it or above it, it must always be positive. You don't want the divergence function to have signs because if you did, then these places where the error is positive and these places where the error is negative are gonna cancel each other out. You don't want that to happen, right? We just know that it's wrong in both places. And so we want the divergence function to be greater than zero if f is not equal to g. We want the divergence function to be zero if, it's, if, if, if f is equal to g. And finally, we want the divergence function to be differentiable with respect to w, which means that if I change the w a little bit, I must have a non-negligible change of uh, the divergence function as well. So this tells me whether I'm doing the right thing, whether I should continue increasing w or whether I should decrease w, right? Uh, oh, it should be not equal to, thank you for catching that. Can you note this? I'll fix it. Yeah, there are some errors. That's a good catch, okay? For classification net fun functor networks, the divergence function is typically not the classification error. Okay. So now how do we learn the network? Let's assume again that the function f has the capacity to exactly represent g. We are going to define the divergence and you're going to integrate the divergence over the entire input. That's going to give me the shaded area. And you're going to learn the parameters w to minimize this total uh, integral of the divergence, ideally. But then let's go one step further. Suppose I know that typically you don't, you know, learning is a tough problem. So you want to focus on what is important, right? Suppose I know that my inputs never go outside this range. They just don't. Then should I spend any effort in minimizing the error outside that range? Not required, right? So that integral doesn't have to go over the entire space. It can just focus on the regions of the input where you will actually be seeing input, the input. You can go one step further. Suppose I see, I expect to see inputs in this range much more frequently than inputs out here. What can I do? I can give the error over here greater weightage and the error over here less weightage, right? Or to just extend it, uh, we can actually weight the divergence with the probability. We'll get back to that. So, but anyway, so we're going to replace the threshold activation with graded activations like Relu's, Sigmoids, uh, Soft Plus, and so on. We're going to, in addition to having a differentiable divergence, we're also going to be changing the activations. We want the activations themselves to be uh, differentiable. So we have two things that must be differentiable, the error, the divergence metric, and the activations, yes. So, uh, when, uh, why do we even need to add a weight for the uh, like, uh, if suppose it is going to be different, uh, the density is going to be different for the input, but as I'm going out all the x, then for that smaller region where I have more inputs, anyways, as I'm going out, I am taking You're, uh, We'll get to that, okay? So, uh, we, will, we will get to that. Anyway, uh, so, uh, we're going to, so the second thing that we want to be differentiable are the activations. We want the activation functions to also be differentiable, right? And then finally, what kind of activation function, one, one particular activation function that we really like for the classification layer is the sigmoid. And I said the sigmoid has an interesting interpretation. What is that? It can actually interpret sigmoid as the a posteriori probability of the class given the input. How so? Consider a uh, 
a problem of this kind. The data are not linearly separable, but your perceptron is trying to draw a linear boundary, right? So what this means is that even for the best case, you're going to have some red dots on the blue side, some blue dots on the red side. Let's look at a one dimensional example, just to simplify. So the input is one dimensional and the data are going to look something like this. There's no threshold, which is going to clearly classify the reds from the blues, but then there's a blue region. If you go far enough into it, it's all blue. There's a red region. If you go far enough into it, it's all red. So at each training point, Let's take a look at a small window around that training point and just plot the average value of the average Y value within that window, which is basically the fraction of inputs within the window which have the value, output value one, right? As I slide this window left to right, initially all inputs, all training instances have class zero. So the blue dot is going to be on the line itself. Then at some point I begin seeing some instances which have Y value one. And so the average begins to go up. And then as I go far enough out, it's going to end up being all one, right? So as you see how this figure came to be. So this curve over here at each point is giving you an estimate of the fraction of training instances whose Y value was one at that point. So this is an estimate of the a posteriori probability of Y being one at that particular value x. And this is, the curve is going to look like, typically go look like this, it's going to be all zero. Initially, uh, you know, the, the uh, data are all class zero, and then you begin seeing increasing numbers of one, and then it's all one. It has this curved shape, and so the sigmoid actually models this shape, which is why we like to have the sigmoid activations in the output layer. It computes the a posteriori probability of y equals one given x. And this is true, not just in one dimension, in any number of dimensions. In two dimensions, the sigma is going to be a sheet which goes from zero to one like so. And it actually always computes the probability that the input belongs to class one. Uh, we're going to return to the fact that perceptrons with sigmoid activations actually model class probabilities in a later lecture, but you know, just telling you why we like sigmoids, okay? Yeah. So going back, my activation function is differentiable, right? If my activation function is differentiable, this means that for small changes of Z, the output is going to change. And I can actually quantify how much a small perturbation in Z is going to change Y. Now Z in turn is a linear combination of the W's and X's, right? It's, it's a, uh, sum of w, w, w times x. So that's just linear. So I know how much a small change of any x is going to change z. And I know because the activation is differentiable, I can compute how much a small change of z can change y. So this means I can tell you how much a small change of x will change y just by chaining these influences. And, and, and similarly, a small change in any of the w's is going to change Z and a small, by a small bit, and a small change of Z is going to change Y. And so I can compute how much a small perturbation of W is going to change Y. This is for a single perceptron. I can do this for an entire network. So if I have this entire network, a small perturbation of that W, weight W, is going to change the output of the highlighted neuron, right? So a small perturbation in W will perturb the output of that neuron. A small perturbation of the output of that neuron in turn is going to change the outputs of the two highlighted neurons in the second layer. And small perturbations of those guys are in turn going to change Y, right? And if everything is differentiable, we can compute these influences. How much does a small change of W change the output of the first neuron? How much does a small change of the output of that neuron change the outputs of the downstream neurons. How much do small perturbations of their outputs change the output? So I can chain all of these up and I can compute how much a small perturbation of W is going to change the output Y. But then I can also find, determine from the output Y, uh, how much a small perturbation of Y is going to change the divergence. And so overall I can determine how much a small change of any W 
is going to change the final divergence. If it's going to decrease the divergence, if decreasing the W will decrease the divergence, then I probably want to be decreasing W. If increasing W is going to you know, decrease it, I want to increase W, right? And I can do this for every one of the parameters in my network. For every single parameter in my network, I can compute how much a small perturbation of that parameter is going to change the output and thereby the divergence. And then I can adjust my parameter to uh, make the, to, I can perturb it in a direction where the divergence is, looks like it will decrease, right? So all of these, how much a small perturbation will change the divergence, it's got to be derived using uh, calculus chain rule. We'll look at that in the next class. But then going back to our function, if f has the capacity to exactly represent g, we want to find the w that minimizes this shaded area, which is the integral of the divergence over the entire input. But then we also saw earlier that you don't want to be focusing on things that won't happen, right? You want to be correct most of the time, which means that more frequent inputs that are more frequent are more important than inputs that are less frequent. If you're going to see a specific input only once in a million years, why are you going to waste any effort trying to ensure that you will fix the, you fix the error for that input? That effort is better spent trying to fix errors on inputs that come in a million times a day, right? So you want to assign a weight to each input, which is the probability of that input. And so the actual error that we will minimize is this guy, which is that at each point, you are weighting the divergence at that input by the probability of the input itself. And you're taking the integral uh, over of this product. So anyone recognize this product? What is that? If you've done your probability, what is that? That's the expectation of the divergence, right? And so we are going to be trying to estimate the weights to minimize the expected divergence. But then going back to our problem, we don't actually have x, uh, the function g of x. We are going to be sampling x and reading g of x. We have this oracle, which is life, right? Which will tell you the value of g of the function for any given x. It just won't give you x, the function g itself. And so we're going to be sampling our x's and reading g of x's, and we're going to be minimizing the error at these points. But then this sampling process must also naturally be such that you learn to minimize error more for more frequent inputs and focus less on less probable inputs. What that means is that that is naturally achieved if you're sampling draws from the actual probability distribution of x. So if you're drawing from the probability distribution of x, you're going to get more pro probable samples more frequently, and you get exactly the kind of behavior that you want. And so uh, just um, as it so happens, when you just draw samples in real life, you're going to be drawing more probable samples more frequently. So just the natural act of collecting data takes care of this issue. And now, instead of trying to minimize the expected divergence, we are going to be minimizing the average divergence over all of our training samples. And this is an this average divergence over all of our training samples is an, is an empirical estimate based on samples that you have observed of the expected divergence or the expected risk. And we are going to be minimizing this empirical estimate of the expected risk to learn our parameters. And so we have a problem of what is called empirical risk minimization. Your problem setting is as follows. You're given a training set of input output pairs where you have a collection of inputs and for each input you have the desired output D, which is a reading of your function G at that input, I'm just calling it D, right? And then you quantify the error on each training instance through this divergence function. Then you compute the average divergence over all of your training samples. And then you estimate your network parameters to minimize this empirical estimate of the expected divergence, which is the empirical risk. And so the overall problem is, uh, and is cast in this manner. It's an empirical risk minimization approach that we will be using. <clears throat> 
Now, just a note, I'm calling this average divergence. Okay, I've, you've been using the term error, divergence, and so on, risk. The popular term here is loss. And so the loss is not really error, it's a measure of the error. Meaning if your error or your divergence goes up, the loss will go up and vice versa. So uh, this ex average divergence is a loss by itself, but you can also have any kind of monotonic function of it, which is, which is more uh, uh, malleable to uh, arithmetic operations. And so here's a problem statement. Given a collection of training samples, you're going to minimize the average divergence over all the samples with respect to W. This is a problem of function minimization, optimization. We're going to go over optimization in the next class. So to close off, yes. The average of the divergences over all the training samples, and uh, instead of using just the divergence, why are we, going to we, are we are computing the divergence at every training instance, and then you are averaging over the entire lot. So, as opposed to as opposed to just summing, yeah. I mean it's just a scaling factor. Yes. So why is the probability term not there? You don't. So the point is, when you take samples, what happens from the when you say draw samples from the probability distribution, what happens? You're just naturally going to see more frequent, more probable samples more frequently. We'll get into that in a few more classes, right? We're kind of done. So uh, closing out, we learn networks by fitting them to training instances from a target function. Learning networks of threshold activation perceptrons requires solving a hard combinatorial optimization problem. Instead, we use continuous activations with non-zero derivatives, which enables us to estimate network parameters. It makes the output of the network differentiable with respect to every parameter of the network. The logistic activation, which is the sigmoid, is actually computes the a posteriori probability of the classes given the input. We define a differentiable divergence between the output of the network and the desired output for training instances. And a total error, a loss, which is the average divergence over all training samples. And we optimize the network to minimize this loss. This is an instance of function minimization. We're going to talk about function minimization in the next class. Any questions? Thank you. Yeah? Fifth point. I didn't actually.